one calculated very accurately. Could you just see that just one moment? Uh, can I see the picture just one moment? Because there's one slight error in it. But I want to call your attention to this pixel didn't come out quite right. There's an error there. Now I come to the next to the next slide. I mean the final slide, the seventh one. Yeah, that's right. That shows them setting up. This is Tom von Sant, and there he is with the, the angles you see and the levels and everything else, setting up his mirror to the correct angle in order to uh, reflect the light into the Landsat in order to produce this picture for us. What happened was, it turned out, after he saw the picture and he went back to discover what happened, a jackrabbit had run over the mirror and changed the angle, so it didn't work. I know that's not got to do with small things, it has to do with large things, but I couldn't resist, to, after I showed you the smallest drawing ever made, to show you that the same artist has also made the largest drawing ever made. And the comparison between the, the eye of the child and this eye can be seen something like this. If you think of the eyelash, which is a hair on the, on the ordinary eye, and magnify that hair until it's about the size of an eye, then an eye gets to be across this room. Then you're halfway there. Then you take an eyelash of that eye and magnify it until it's across this room, and the big eye is two and a half kilometers. Another way of expressing the size is to say, let us go up another scale of the same amount again of another hundred thousand. What and try to draw an eye? Where would we have to draw it? What is it? A hundred thousand times bigger than the two and a half kilometer eye. It turns out is a beautiful eye in the heavens, namely Saturn with her rings. So that gives you some idea of the enormous scale, both up and all the way down. How tiny that draw that drawing actually is, as two and a half kilometers is to your eye so that your eye is to that original first drawing, which is so very tiny. The next question is, what about making computers still smaller? And now I launch onto another thing. Not a question of what's practical today, but what's in principle practical. It's already noticed, for instance, that if we were to try to make the wires about half as big or a third as big as the wires in that particular design, it's a strange thing that when wires carry electricity too long, they move, the matter moves. It doesn't move much. It doesn't make any difference there, but when the wires are very much thinner, it tears the wires apart. So you can't you have a problem with wires, and everybody's worrying about that. But that's like the sound barrier. You may never be all too young to have heard of the sound barrier, but there was once a time when it was said that no airplane can travel faster than the speed of sound. And the reason was, of course, that airplanes were designed, considering, for instance, assuming that the air does, is not essentially not very compressible. It's not easy to squeeze it into a small space because the airplanes went small, slow enough that there wasn't much force to squeeze it into a small space, so it always expanded. It was always not squeezed. And the theory and the analysis and the experiments all dealt with air that was not compressed. It was then realized that if you took into account the compression, that airplane wouldn't work with its propeller and everything wouldn't work. The propeller would go too fast and it wouldn't pull. So there was a barrier. How are we going to go fast in the speed of sound? It just means there's no, but there's no law of physics that says that you can't go fast in the speed of sound. It just requires a completely different design. So these limitations that you hear about mean only that you can't go on with the same design. But it doesn't mean that it's not possible in principle. And therefore, I have considered the question, never mind about making it with wires. Let's make it a different way, make computers a different way, with atoms, with interactions, with certain kinds of connections. How small can it be made? Can it be made so that each uh, one atom, in a, the state of one atom, tells you yes or no instead of gold and silver? And the answer is, of course, that the laws of physics that you have to use are very different than the laws here. They're called quantum mechanical laws. The scale is so small, we have to worry about the uncertainty principle and everything else. But just let me tell you that it turns out to be possible, <laughs> according to the laws of physics in principle, to build a computer in which each bit or each little piece of information is one atom large. And there's no problem in that. And it was something I had some fun working on. <laughs> but I said that this talk was about machines. and. Of course, a computer is a kind of machine. But the machine you usually think of when you think of machines is machines with movable parts. 
Now let us talk about the possibility of making machines of movable parts which are very tiny. The immediate look in all the faces, what for? Mental entertainment. <laughs> Maybe someday they'll find a use for it, okay? <laughs> How small can we make machines? It's just thinking for the fun of it, okay? You don't worry about it, that hasn't any application. It doesn't cost you anything not to have an application. It's just fun. Okay, so we're not going to worry about how we use these dumb things. We're just going to try to make them. How could we make movable matter, little machines, tiny machines that would operate that are very, very small? You see, today we have great big hands, and they're this fat and lumpy, and we can make tiny little watches. But that's nothing compared, I don't mean a computer watch, because that's not got moving parts, but a machine with moving parts inside that is extremely small. Now how can we do that? One way that has been suggested is this. You know that the power, the, the radioactive plants and so on have to manipulate bottles and turn nut, nuts and so forth, and they have slave hands which are operated through electrical connections with bigger hands. You move these levers and it controls the hands on the other end of the wire. Well, there's no reason why the hands on the other end of the wire, that is wrenches and whatever they are, you know, they're operated from out here, need to be the same size as the thing. So you have the wires run to control very tiny wrenches to make small things. And what do you make with that? You make another pair of hands that are still smaller. <laughs> so that now you can reconnect your wires to a smaller set of hands in which you work for a while manufacturing things at a smaller scale and then with those making things at a smaller scale and so on. Of course, when you got all through with this, you'd say, ah, you've only got one pair of hands to make one tiny little machine. But actually, the right way to do it, naturally, is that when you made the first pair, you make two pairs, 